I used to be a terrible sleeper. I'm still not one of the greatest, but I have noticed that food has a substantial impact on body rhythm. Mm. So my body knows that when I eat part of the day, whatever is left must be either evening or morning. So first time I experimented with time restricted feeding, I kind of skipped breakfast, had a fatty coffee, I was getting my head around it and you know experimenting with the usual things. And it was great, it was fantastic. But then I started to notice that stress hormones had to start to come in in the afternoon. And I was having lunch, I would still have some form of a dip. And then I started to see this also in some other patients. So I started to observe that some people can do very well on uh, perhaps prolonging that fast in the morning and having maybe an early lunch and not such a late dinner. Some other people, I'm one of them, do very well doing the opposite. So have very good breakfast and a very late lunch or a very early dinner and then fast in that manner. Mm. My sleep has dramatically improved. We're talking nearly 20%, just like that. Today's show is brought to you by our pals over at blueblocks.com, leaders in an assortment of tools and technologies to help get you sleeping better and to help support your body's circadian clock system so that when you get up in the morning, you feel great, energized, ready to start your day. If you don't yet have a Remedy Sleep Mask, I don't know what you're waiting for. Honestly, I wear this thing every single night. I've had three different pairs of these. They work so good. Let me just kind of put it on. I know it'll look funny. There's absolutely no light coming through here. So what makes this sleep mask different from all the other sleep masks out there is it totally blocks out any and all light and it doesn't block your nose from breathing properly throughout, throughout the night. You know you should be breathing through your nose, not through your mouth when you're sleeping. The Remini sleep mask was made for nose breathing, which is really, really cool. So this is a phenomenal sleep mask. Women love it because it doesn't leave indentations on your skin and your face. It's really small and sleek. Now, I know, unfortunately, you're probably, you and your family, are spending a lot of time on screens nowadays. Your kids are doing virtual school. You're probably working from home on computer screens more than you normally would. So you should own a pair of blue light filtering glasses from Blue Blocks. Why? Because they scientifically validate their lenses to ensure they're filtering out the yucky blue light emanating from your LED screens and various technologies. So you can hop on over to blueblocks.com. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Check out the Remedy Sleep Mask and their blue light filtering glasses. Glasses. They make an range of frames and lenses to really help you mitigate some of the unhealthy light, especially during these shorter days. Again, you can use the coupon code to save HIH at checkout over at blueblocks.com. That's B L U B L O X.com. Now, back to today's show. Alessandra Freddy shares some really interesting insights about how to use food and meal timing to improve your body's circadian clock system. So when it comes to intermittent fasting and or time-restricted feeding, a lot of people think about this in the context of lowering glucose, lowering inflammation. There was that study from the spring of 2019 that showed that early time-restricted feeding enhanced autophagy, which is all good stuff in longevity biomarkers, but a lot of us should be sleeping more and a lot of us have perturbed sleep, especially during the winter time, right? Because we're getting a lot of artificial light exposed, you know, the days are shorter, we're not getting enough sunlight. And so that can augment and, and you know, negatively impact our sleep. So Alessandro has some great tips in today's show about being consistent with your meal timing to further entrain your body's circadian clock system. Now, this might sound new to you, but the science has actually been out for quite some time. So I would like you to consider this, especially if you're having adrenal issues, hormonal issues, thyroid issues, digestive issues, mood instability, mental challenges, and things like that. I know a lot of us are more stressed now than ever. Please consider using food as a means to optimize your body's circadian clock system. And so that means compressing your feeding window, whatever that works for you, you know, whether it's eating in the morning or pushing your first meal out till later in the early afternoon, 
you know, whatever floats your boat and whatever you find optimizes your digestion, your mental well-being, your energy, your athletic performance, and all of that. But uh, Alessandro has some really good insights in this podcast to help us better understand how to reframe how we view food. We do talk about nutritional ketosis and being fat adapted and all these great things. But uh, towards the end, especially, we dive into using food as a tool to support your body's circadian clock systems and circadian rhythm. So I really hope you enjoy this podcast. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for hitting that like button. And let's cut back to it with Alessandro. Thanks for tuning back in. We're live with my friend Alessandro Ferretti. As you may know, he was on about a year ago and we talked about heart rate variability and how being in a state of nutritional ketosis improves your heart rate variability, which when Alessandro and I met in Austin, I was particularly intrigued uh, by that aspect of nutritional ketosis, and that was really exciting because it's not just about you know um, performance, but reducing the inflammatory response. So, Alessandro, uh, since we really hit the nail on the head about heart rate variability, let's kind of uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. But I would love to explore uh, time restricted feeding because this sure. is really confusing for people, right? Especially in fitness. Yeah, I think uh, my. Uh, very light uh, partial OCD brain which my lady calls the OCD I call it uh, I love my research too much um, <laughs> time restricted feeding to me is um, what we call either the 16-8 or you know the kind of time in the day that you the person abstain from ingesting any caloric value substrate of food. I know that there are uh, different styles of doing that. Some people use stimulants with fats. Uh, yeah, okay, that can be good. Yet, uh, uh, the greatest result I found is when people abstain from having anything at all. Mm. Okay, so I see very different glu glucose regulations, very different ketones readings, both breath and uh, blood. Um, and, and then we have the more fasting, alternate days fasting. To me, the word fasting is associated with 24 hours, mm -hmm. non-ingestion of solid or liquids that will have some form of value and bring in value. So interestingly enough, what I'm starting to observe is that the, the, the more fat adapted the person becomes and the more regular are ketones in both breath and blood, um, the stronger is the correlation to an increased HRV, not at times necessarily associated with heart rate. Mm. So, and this is what led me to go down that rabbit hole, one of the uh, few I have <laughs> at present. And, um, and it was really interesting to, to, to actually see that that type of time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting uh, seems to really suit well uh, changes within inflammatory response to sympathetic activation. So some people have claimed because of the GABA glutamic acid balance, some people have claimed because it's a cleaner fuel for the mitochondria. Um, I can't differentiate that specifically. Mm -hmm. Definitely I know that the combination of these factors uh, can be contributive to a, a, an increased HIV and also it's a lasting thing. It's not an immediate thing. So if you have, a, for example, a, a, a cold shower, you notice an immediate increase in heart rate variability, mm -hmm. meaning it's a good thing, uninflamed, parasympathetic, but within a space of time, it will go back to the original inflammatory response activation. So I think that's quite important because it's a more sustainable way to keep your inflammatory response and sympathetic activation under control or definitely monitoring. Now, there was a lot of talk this weekend at the Low Carb Conference about the secondary benefits of beta-hydroxybutyrate and that, yeah. that these ketones are more signaling molecules. They're not just like substitutions for macronutrients or energy substrates. That, like, that they yeah. do so much more. So we're, what in your, if we want to take a deep dive into the mechanisms here, because a lot of people yeah. that listen to the show like to know the details, right? So are, yeah. are you thinking that it's that the ketones are affecting metabolic signatures and inflammatory signatures, and that's why we're seeing these bumps in HRV? Um, the, the answer is definitely is a contributing factor, Mike, because the, we know that we have some association as per being a cleaner fuel, let's say, um, 
especially with beta hydroxy. I mean, we, we, there are mainly three ketones. Well, to be technically correct, there are two. One is called a ketone, yet is not quite a ketone. But anyhow, for, for simplicity, let's say ketones in blood, which is beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate have slightly different functions and they promote anything going from epigenetic control we're talking about uh, you know histone the acetylation function they're talking about mitochondria protection they were talking about all sort of um, anti-inflammatory pathway le less amount of free radicals out of the mitochondria which some of these can be still achieved through beta oxidation so not technically necessarily via ketones yet the ketones then want to exacerbate that process so and reinforce it and enhance it and at the same time they have they have function in their own right that mm -hmm. will actually support a better uh, uh, um, a lack of strong sympathetic activation and a better in a way controlled inflammatory response so yeah definitely i think that there are uh, mechanism and so for example if i want to if i'm lecturing or if i want to go in a in a certain uh, uh, training sessions when i know is going to be a very high intensity and repeated high intensity i'd really like to see my blood ketone a minimum of one millimolar mm -hmm. That's the minimum I want to. Uh, you can increase this in all sorts of different ways, reasonably quickly with MCTs and 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 um, or even exogenous ketones if you are happy to experiment with that. Um, but then, what's really interesting is that, for example, using these methods in in training, you may not see an improvement in the recovery or that you recover faster, but what I have noticed is there is less inflammation to start with. Mm. Therefore, the person recovers faster, not because he recovers faster, but because there is less damage to start in the first place. The baseline is below. That is ah. correct, because the heart recovery rate is better. The degree of inflammatory response is already lower. Even in high intensity exercise, when we know that we have to use the glycolytic pathway most of the times. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a very important distinction to make, and I would definitely agree uh, with, with your statement in, in, in saying that, yeah, definitely there, is, uh, there are many other more, many more mechanisms that some of them we are very aware of, some others I don't think we fully understand, mm -hmm. or definitely I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but these mechanisms um, can get people very excited about this, and so that they yeah. realize that it's not just a dietary shift; it's a whole metabolic shift, immune shift, you know, anti-aging. I mean, it's yeah. it's a whole epigenetic. There's like you mentioned. Precisely. So I think it's a really great way. It's a lifestyle shift, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And that's um, pretty exciting. So, what was interesting about what you just said that I ha now have a different perspective, because we know that. Um, you know, intense interval training, high intensity stuff, we want a little bit of free radical, you know, interleukin-6, yes. for example, within the muscle cell has beneficial properties. So that's why taking antioxidants after training is generally not advised, it's bad. Correct. So yeah. what you're saying, and so what we know that we don't make as many free radicals yeah. when we're in a state of ketosis, but what you're saying, the benefits there is the baseline's just lower. So you, it's not like we're buffering all the beneficial inflammatory processes yes. that cause the adaptations, we're just, the baseline's lower so you don't get over the, into like a pathological threshold. That is correct. That is correct. So, for example, <clears throat> when I do a certain type of training where I do not want tissue breakdown, so I'm training, for example, uh, type 2B fiber, so training my speed and, and, and etc. So, I'm training my muscle, well, my neuromuscular activation to be quicker and faster and, and you know, in, in sparring and so on. Um, there and then, I want that inflammatory response. Mm. If I'm doing power training, where intentionally I'm breaking down fiber to rebuild them uh, stronger, or for example, a bodybuilder wants to create a hypertrophy effect, then in that case, I still think that there is a use because they might be able to train for a little bit longer, mm -hmm. or it is not gonna completely reduce the inflammatory response and negate the effect of the training. Right. Yet, I think that would be uh, um, I think it would be wise 
to perhaps have these systems integrated with the training in order to maximize the training output. Mm. Uh, definitely um, one of the people, and I started to say this 10 years ago, do not stop inflammation when, if you're recovering from whatever is training. So when inflammation is completely out of control, this is when you want to stop it. So when my L3 and L4, the tip of the vertebra gets inflamed, which is totally a histological response and is totally non-beneficial, is not going to recover the tissue, is just going to create inflammatory response on the nerves of the spine, I want to stop that inflammatory response. On the other hand, if I'm recovering from uh, a, a bug or a fever or uh, unless it's obviously dangerous, mm -hmm. you know, above 40, you think, right, okay, ambulance, everyone, yeah, to, to paracetamol, give me what you got, yeah. it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but generally speaking, in a training response, where, 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 where the person is rebuilding healthy tissue, then in that case, I'm one of the people saying, don't stop, don't blunt the inflammatory response because you blunt your, you, you will have less pain, but you also prolong the actual recovery of the tissue. So to me, that's a really important distinction. Mm -hmm. It is my understanding, given my findings, that, and the findings of my colleagues as well, um, that the, the, the going on a diet and using ketones in order to mitigate that, it will keep your mitochondria healthy. Mm. It will have less damage to the mitochondria, yet stimulating biogenesis at the same time. So that I think is the advantage that we actually get. Hmm. Really interesting. I want to make sure that I interpreted that properly because there was a lot there. So when you're doing more neuromuscular training, like, like a new kick, just let's pause. You're yeah. a double black belt in judo and karate. You just want people to know. So you're yeah. competing at a high level. So if you're learning a new kick or a new throwing pattern or you know chop, whatever it is, yeah. I'm not using the vernacular properly, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you would want maybe a little bit more sugar there so you, that you cause damage to cause those neuromuscular pathways to fire? Or did I interpret that wrongly? So um, we have a certain amount of glycogen as Jeff, Mm -hmm. Volek mentioned Peter Defty and I found out by myself we have a certain amount of stores for glycolytic pathway to be readily activated. Mm -hmm. At a certain intensity the body will switch and the intensity that for example we sometimes train at or a, a person will train at if it, if it goes over a certain intensity and is protracted, it will involve the use of glycolytic pathway. Right. Now, <clears throat> glycogen stores are cleaner compared to glucose usage. Uh, there is less acidity and it can be used very quickly. Uh, I want to be able to access that fuel whenever I have that intensity and then a base of fat adaptation and ketones will make sure that then the inflammatory response and every other uh, benefit from uh, a fat adapted person will stay. In an instance where you're training your ability, learning new things, and you want to train your neuromuscular activation to be quicker, then I would not want to create extra inflammatory response unless it's needed. Whereas if you are specifically doing power training in order to get more, more strength in your legs. So for example, when I go into a horse riding stance, I put a bar across my leg and the bar has not to fall and I practice punches and I practice that kind of stuff. My legs will be sore due to pyruvic acid accumulations. Uh, been trying to buffer by lactic acid and etc but it will cause tissue damage mm -hmm. and that is the one I don't want to blunt because that is rebuilding new tissue. It's causing that, adaptation. Precisely yeah. so, mm -hmm. precisely so. Mm -hmm. Or a bodybuilder that wants to use for example uh, um, ways to break down their tissue in order to, 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 to build a bigger muscle um, at the same time you, want, you don't want to blunt that 
kind of healing process in order to build a better tissue, a stronger tissue, or create that hypertrophic effect. Mm. What's interesting about that is bodybuilders used to take supplemental arachidonic acid. That interesting. Which is, and we know that that's very stimulatory, very yeah. inflammatory, and that's why we know that yeah. omega-6 get converted to arachidonic acid, they cause inflammation. So that's yeah. interesting, uh, it, it kind of sense. makes, I never really totally understood why, but now it's making sense that that tissue damage causes the adaptation, that causes the muscle to get bigger and stronger for the next Correct. event. But when you're training your neurology, you really want that repetition to yeah. fire those pathways. Just precisely, precisely. Mm -hmm. and, and also that uh, kind of why casein is so effective. Mm. You know, sometimes you have companies advertising casein at a certain amount of the day, at yeah. a certain amount of, uh, in a certain amount at a specific time of the day, and then for other uh, purposes, you can use whey or you can use a uh, vegetarian proteins, whatever someone wants. So they want the more inflammatory protein in order to stimulate perhaps a post-workout kind of healing to generate more inflammation to shorten the time that is taken for the tissue to be rebuilt. Mm. Interesting. That's really fascinating. Uh, let's kind of transition a little bit to like post-workout nutrition. You have a really yep. interesting paradigm. Um, a lot of people have been taught that they have to have the protein and the carbs to spike glycogen replenishment and spike insulin and it's really Again, it's a new way of living, new way of training. The thing that I would want to pay attention to is the frequency and at what intensity. So the body through gluconeogenesis coming from either glycerol, from fats or protein for the amino acids that are able to be converted into glucose can rebuild the stores. The concern that we need to perhaps pay attention to is how quickly. So given if I have two or three days to recover, I'm not going to backload of carbs. It does, the body that's, will do it naturally. The body will do it naturally. And Volek has shown this, mm. right? And on the other hand, if I were to have two, for whatever reasons of madness, two very hard sessions, one consecutive, the other one two consecutive days, for example, then I would perhaps integrate with some carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. The body has an amazing ability to, to, um, to build muscles, to recover, to heal. And I think, uh, I looked at the research of, of you know, post-training, uh, integrations for glucose, trying to raise insulin and etc, etc. I tend to use the same kind of logic we, we spoke about earlier. Is my muscle being damaged because that was the purpose of the session mm -hmm. and I want to rebuild new lean tissue, bigger quads or whatever, then in that case I might go for something that will create an insulin spike. So instead of having instead of not having anything for a few hours, I would probably integrate that with avocados, a couple of bananas, MCTs, and you know, whey protein for people who are not sensitive to it, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. However, we don't have to but we still have to bear in mind that if the body doesn't have any dietary intake, it seems to favor human growth hormones and testosterone secretion. We also want those. Mm. So what sometimes I do, I prolong that faster state. And when I see the glucose back into baseline and starting to taper down, this is when I have my next meal or a smoothie or a post-workout. But it, it, it can be two or three hours later. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I train in the evening mainly, I go to bed still fasted and I have breakfast the following day. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed is that the longer you fast, the slightly shorter seems to me the recovering period. There is some evidence now that actually shows that if you prolong that fast state post-training, um, there are secretions of human growth hormone and testosterone uh, which obviously they can increase the actual healing and recovery therefore shortening that recovery time in the total recovery time so 
yeah, I mean, uh, fr from so there's some from benefit, really, definitely, to not doing a, a, the immediate poke because yeah. a lot of people have protein in the car. I mean, I, I used to do this, you know, go to the, go to the gym, with yeah, the protein me too. shake and some carbs because that's what everything me too. is. Me too, me too, me too. Wow. I have stopped doing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that I hardly train with any weights at all. Um, mm -hmm. Speaks for itself. The mass, the mass says stay the same, if yeah. not got improved. improved slightly. And you've not gotten younger in that period of time. Apparently not. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean that as a compliment. I was no, 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 I know. Yeah, no, and no. you're very physically fit and strong. So uh, if people can't tell through the cameras, like your shoulders and delts and triceps, like it looks like you are a weightlifter, but you just yeah. you barely do any weights. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, quite a few people mention, uh, so, you, you know, you spend lots of time down the gym, hey? Yeah. And I just very, very, very recently bought a pair of uh, um, dumbbells, the one that you can regulate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I just integrate now some very little uh, strength training, uh, but I'm talking once every couple of weeks. Wow. So it's not, that's, that, I can't tell you that saying I go down to the gym and, you know, so, so then, no, no, nothing wrong yeah. with weights. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, um, I think we need to move perhaps slightly away from that mentality because the, 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 there are benefits, but the body is way more intelligent than having to rely to food after intense effort. In fact, if we look, for example, most of the animal kingdom, after a major stress response or a major whatever happened, animals don't eat, mm. unless they catch the thing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So uh, this speaks volumes to the improved uh, maybe nitrogen retention and muscle protein synthesis and yes. things in the keto adapted state. And so a yeah. lot of researchers, you know, at this conference talked about that. And so yeah. um, clearly evidence speaks for itself with, with clients that you've worked with and you personally. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 one of my current uh, research area is, is uh, food substrates versus calorie. Cutting a little story short, I went for a bike ride. I was sore, I was bruised from training. Uh, it was a karate training and I tend to recover by doing a gentle bike ride. And I cycled very gently, 130, 135 bits per minute uh, for a couple of hours. Go off the bike, 1,287 calories burned. And I went, there is absolutely no way I have, I. I'm not even sweaty and I'm not, I'm, I'm a rubbish cyclist. And I thought there's something not quite right because last week I did a really heavy session that gave me a fever until the following day with 50 calories less mm. for two hours of karate in a grading. And I thought this doesn't make any sense. So I started to research and now we know, and we've been knowing this for quite some time, that the, 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 the fat adaptation is more efficient but you cannot utilize substrate as quickly in lack of oxygen as the glycolytic pathway. So we know that and it's fine. And one of the things that we, we, we noticed is that from 18 carbon fatty acid, you get 129 ATP. From the glycolytic pathway going through the TCA cycle and electrotransport chain, at best for the equivalent 18 carbons, which is three glucose molecules, that's six carbon molecules times three, you get best 96. Mm. So the calories in a fat adapted people are out because in fat adapted people, you produce less heat, thermogenesis, and you produce more ATP given the same number of carbons you have. On top of that, you have other benefits that we mentioned earlier, mm. cleaner fuel, but it's a slow burning fuel. So if you need to heat up things pretty quickly, it is not the fuel that perhaps you may want to consider. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the fasting, I think, exacerbates this fuel efficiency. And I think that's really important because the timing and the quantity are very, very different from what we were taught at college. Because I should not be here. 
Mm-hmm. Or definitely I shouldn't be here as healthy as I assume to be. Um, so therefore, I look at these timings, quantities in a very, very different way now. It's not the, the, you know, the usual creating the high insulin peak post training in order to, because that, that generate all sorts of other problems. So if someone wants to create that inflammatory response because he wants to rebuild new lean mass, fine. But personally, to recover quicker, <clears throat> I tend to perhaps prolong that fasting post training. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. So roughly 25% of the calories from sugar are lost as heat through the combustion. Yeah, it, it, if his glycogen can be perhaps a little bit less, mm. if his glucose, uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but there is a good portion that is actually lost. Uh, but they have the advantage that in, 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 in hypoxic condition, they can still be used. Mm. Whereas fat oxidation eventually will come to a, to, to a very, very small percentage of utilization and really high intensity if he's protracted. Mm. So sprinting, <coughs> intense weight training, yeah. CrossFit, like... Precisely mm-hmm. so, precisely so. If he's one sprint and the people are training, or if he's one, I don't know, it's short burst and he lasts 20, 30 minutes, they don't need glucose for that. Mm. In, in, my, in, in my karate sessions, for example, which is drills, sparring, forms, all perform at certain levels. So you are maxed out, resting, maxed out, resting, maxed out, resting. I don't take anything. One, we are not allowed. Two, I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise you're really metabolically in trouble to a point that you can't actually use up your glycogen stores very efficiently and the body cannot make glucose in your blood. You have other problems associated with the total ketogenic diet. Very interesting, but what comes to mind, so for CrossFit people that are doing competitions, yeah. what would be your preferred or approved, Alessandro approved form of glucose, <laughs> you know, to add that rocket fuel back in? Uh, okay, so the kind of don't try this at home mm-hmm. unless you've got time and unless you're happy to fail. So generally speaking, I would look for a good ground base of fat adaptation. That would be the first thing to build. We need to get the body able to burn as much fat as possible at the highest intensity as we can. That is going to take time. We can enter ketosis in a matter of weeks. We can be constantly in ketosis still in a matter of weeks, between 6 and 12 weeks. But to become truly fat adapted, which means that your body preferentially uses fat in order to supply energy at whichever demand is possible, given the amount of oxygen we have available, meaning intensity, then following a period of adaptation that in my, in my findings, and Peter Defty has found exactly the same, and some of my other colleagues, it can go from three to nine months. So if you're racing next week, is not the thing to try. Yeah. In fact, I would say do what you've done before, maybe increase the fat if they're too low, maybe don't rely on certain type of glucose if you have been relying on that for all the time. Following that, I would start, we know also that people that constantly stay in ketogenesis, they might have some glut adaptation um, to the ketogenic diet, which has an inhibitory effect on the function of gluts. Mm. You might not want that if you're a crossfitter or someone that trains at high intensity um, speed work. So in order to compensate for that, we need to retrain the body to stay in ketosis for as much as we can, really push up that boundary of using the, 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 the fats as a primary source of fuel until oxygenly possible, has that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, And then we can use the glycolytic pathway, any kind of higher intensity above that. Mm. That requires quite a bit of failing. If they're not used to it, they will eventually run out and they will express the same kind of feeling of what we call in in, in jargon is the bonking feeling and you have the, 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 the lack of energy, you feel empty. 
and then you need to reweight to start to recouple again in the back in fat adaptation. Mm -hmm. So, but what I've noticed and what we have noticed is that if you keep training, so if you have your baseline work, optimizing your fat adaptation and taking as far as you can, and then intermittently you integrate trainings that will take you over and back down, over and back down constantly, you don't seem to have that glue glut deep sensitization to actually use glucose. That would be ideal for me to look at crossfitters or people that do the type of sports I do and they train prolongedly over, you know, for example, one to one to two hours. Mm -hmm. This is what I would do. Interesting. So you wouldn't recommend an intra-workout source of glucose. You would just incur the body <laughs> just will slowly adapt over time and that glycolytic metabolism will be fueled by your body's ability to embark on gluconeogenesis. Which that is, yes, mm -hmm. um, there are a few upregulations that you can notice, as also Bolek mentioned, um, there is lactic acid regeneration. So once the lactic acid has finished to, to, to buffer pyruvates uh, and is uptaken, you know, corticycle and etc., then the body can make that. However, in the second hour of high intensity, constant dipping in and out of this really highly uh, anaerobic state, I would definitely use glucose. Mm. As in, I would use ratios of maltodextrin to fructose, generally two to one, but I wouldn't go over 30, maximum 40 grams per hour. Mm. Okay. That I would use it without any shadow of a doubt, um, but it is prolonged. I see people after 20 minutes drinking their keto and then starting to add glucose. Well, that, that, that defeats the whole point mm -hmm. um, because it's just asking the body to switch back to glycolytic pathway because they're providing glucose right, as a primary crutch. source of fuel. Yeah, absolutely. So to me in the second hour, then I can start to think if my bike ride it starts, I decided to go for a heel session, so I'm not recovering, I want to kind of blast it. Then in that case, after the first hour, hour and a half, I might add some glucose. Glucose here is not the enemy, it's just we don't have to constantly rely on it. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I really wish. People will stop arguing about keto works, keto doesn't, glycolytic works, glycolytic doesn't, and actually start to see, okay, what are the benefits that we can use from one and when are the times in which we have to use the other one? Because there, there are two realities that can be combined, but I think it's taking a little bit of, of, of doing because obviously there are two kind of facets of people. Uh, so to me, it's really, really important to integrate the two, but when and if it's needed. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And it requires a certain level of commitment you know, oh, yeah. because otherwise, I think a lot of people like to experiment with things, like experiment with branching amino acids, experiment with biohacking and sleep and wearing blue light blocking glasses and these little things that you get the immediate reward right away. Yeah. And there's really no downside. But when you're experimenting with ketosis, there's a reward and then a, you take like three steps forward, one step back or yeah. one step sideways, right? And so what, what you're saying is you expect to fail a little bit while you're becoming a very keto adapted. Precisely, Mike. I mean, for some people, it lasts months, mm. and it's really a hit and miss because it depends. I don't have, I'm not the fly on the wall on these people's house yeah. or on their shoulder to actually see what they actually do. I believe that what they write uh, in, <clears throat> you know, in, in apps where I can access to these apps and check what they do, what they've done with heart availability. Um, I believe that what they say is true, but there are so many things that we need to take in consideration uh, that they have to adapt. It's a different paradigm metabolically for the body. It's, it's a different paradigm, which in a way should be an addendum but for some people that have been glycolytic for the last 30, 40 years, especially the one involved in, in sports, um, it, it's a completely new thing that they have to re-explore, reactivate, uh, rediscover in actually using. So that's the reason why there is so, high, so much inhibition from, from the body and retention tries to say, hang on a minute, mm -hmm. this, is, this is my blanket, I don't want to lose it. Mm -hmm. And the body will 
in a way let you know that that's not actually working. Um, sometimes they don't replenish glycogen and they train high intensity. Sometimes they lose completely the ability of fat adapt, um, uh, even at low intensities. And this is going to take time over time over time. But the most important way that I have found is to provide that groundwork, high, very high volume, very low intensity, to really allow the body to start to crank up on burning fats and then push you up a bit and then back down. So you, you kind of do like a modular training, but you do that for substrate mm -hmm. rather than for your muscle. Mm -hmm. That has been, this is what we've found to be the most efficient way to become very well fat adapted. And then the ketones, interestingly, the ketones in the blood will drop and stay down because the body's not having to store them in blood. It's just going to use them. Mm -hmm. And breath ketones are through the roof. This is when I normally assume the people are very well fat adapted. So for people that are just experimenting with this initially, the body's not really well adapted, so the, I see the blood ketones are very high. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a little bit there that people will go in and out of ketosis when they're adapting. Yeah. Uh, how much of that is influenced by environmental stressors, sleep issues, uh, <laughs> and question. all that? I mean, is there a lot of correlation there? Yeah, I mean, um, the same amount of protein coming from two different sources, one can take me out of ketosis. If, I'm, if my body is reacting very heavily to it, it will go into an emergency state. And th the body will be in an alert mode. So um, one thing I've found really interesting is, is that, for example, if someone has a, an unpleasant event and is short, sharp, and intense, like a, a scare. Mm -hmm. They might exit ketosis, but if and when they do, they're back in it very quickly. The constant prolonged medium intensity type of stress, that's the one that keeps the kind of fat burning always on it. It, it, it stumbles people adaptation. So that's something also to consider. There are many environmental factors that can can affect people's ability. So lack of sleep is a big one. Environmental stress, uh, they're normally negative, so the de-stress, not the eustress. Foods, as we know. So definitely there are things to consider <clears throat> that can sabotage this, this process or, or make it harder for the person to enter ketosis. Mm. And so that's why, I mean, this is a lifestyle. This isn't just a yeah. diet, this is a lifestyle. And I think why this is so important because we need people to embark in lifestyle change. Not just eat a gluten-free diet and expect all your ailments to go away. Yeah. It's more of a lifestyle shift. I have never suggested to people not to do something that I am researching as I have with ketogenic application, especially in sport performance. Exactly as you say, is a total commitment. You, you need to be aware, especially if you are intermittent fasting and the, the one that you're skipping is in the evening. When do we socialize? Most likely in the evening. So do I want every time to explain to people what I do? And I, make, I don't make that mistake any longer. So if I'm invited to a dinner party, I don't say that I'm involved in health and I'm a nutritionist because then my evening is gone. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, one of the things that I... I, I, I Ask people, what is your degree of commitment? In a way, how badly do you want it? And if they are happy to take that kind of investment. But this is, this is for a, either a therapeutic effect, so people are highly motivated, you know, cancer, epilepsy, everything that you know, research has shown to, 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 to benefit out of uh, ketogenic application. Yet not to be confused with low-carb, high-fat diet non-ketogenic. So some people can go low carb and increase the fats to a good level, maintain a medium protein level and still get benefits. Um, may these people be fully ketotic? Probably not, but they still get some benefits. Yet we don't have to confuse that for a full fat adapted ketogenic diet. And I think this is, if someone wants to take it not that kind of step further, 
then I normally question their commitment. That's actually the first thing. The first thing I say, I don't see patients anymore uh, so much. Someone is referred to me uh, by some colleagues or whatever. First thing I say is why? Not how long, not what you did. Why do you want to embark on this protocol? And then, and then I dig in a bit further because it's a true, full, anything, uh, you know, flu here. Mm -hmm. What meal shall I book? In, with the airline. I'm gluten-free, I don't tend to have much dairy, not, not casein-based dairy. Uh, it's not a problem if I have it, I'm not sensitive to pipe milk to gluten, yet if I can avoid it, but then it has to be high fat or low carbs. If you, if, if you order gluten-free, you have this kind of synthetic radioactive buns that you, you, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you as a night, night, night time to see where you're actually going. <laughs> yeah, right. But I wouldn't have those, right? Yeah. So you bring your own avocado and you, 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 yeah. you know the story, right? Yeah. yeah. So it will require a lot of commitment. They, they, they need to be motivated. They need to be committed. But also they need the ability to do it. Meaning, there is a certain degree of knowledge that is involved. Mm -hmm. They can't just go into any uh, restaurant and say, oh, can I have a keto meal? You can ask a gluten-free meal, yeah. but you know, can I have a you know, low carb high fat? Okay, do you want more butter or something? So it, it requires quite a bit of preparation before. I tend to, in my first, uh, in my first visit, when and if I see someone, I, I want to empower the person with the knowledge first, understanding their environment if it's possible to do it, and then, okay, great, fantastic, if you are committed enough and you know, you're happy to go ahead and expect some potentially a vampire, not all the time, but definitely is likely to happen. Mm -hmm. So a great starting place for some people that are interested in this might be just low carb, high fat. Yeah. Get some adaptation, experiment, yeah. and then maybe do a little intermittent fast and then start checking breath uh, acetone as you mentioned. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. So let, let's kind of finish off maybe where we started about this time restricted feeding. Sure. It's really interesting about like if you look at the circadian rhythm research, it, yeah. it shows that our gut is really active like in the middle part of the day and stuff. And yeah. so I always it always made sense to me that you should have like a lot of your calories when your gut is from a circadian rhythm standpoint most active from enzymatic function, motility. But when you're keto adapted, like you mentioned, your body's more efficient. You don't need to eat as much. You're not as hungry. What have you found with the time restricted feeding? So, with time restricted feeding, uh, I've, I've experimented quite a bit. Now, generally speaking, I used to be a terrible sleeper. I'm still not one of the greatest, but um, I have noticed that food has a substantial impact on body rhythm. Now. I seem to be one of the very few people lecturing across UK and US and whatever other countries not to suffer from any jet lag. And what I tend to do to regulate that definitely is down to food. Mm. So my body knows that when I eat part of the day, whatever is left must be either evening or morning. So first time I experimented with time restricted feeding, I kind of skipped breakfast, had a fatty coffee, I was getting my head around it and you know, experimenting with the usual things. And it, it was great, it was fantastic. But then I started to notice that stress hormones had to start to come in in the afternoon. And I was having lunch, I would still have some form of a dip. Bear in mind that I have also predispositions for type 2 diabetes and mm. I still have the predisposition but clearly completely different blood glucose levels and, and so on. And then I started to see this also in some other patients. So I started to observe that some people can do very well on uh, perhaps prolonging that fast in the morning and having maybe an early lunch and not such a late dinner. Some other people, I'm one of them, do very well doing the opposite. So have very good breakfast and a very late lunch or a very early dinner and then fast in that manner. Mm. My sleep has dramatically improved. We are talking nearly 20%, just like that. Wow. Within less than three days and is consistent, consistently at that level. So 
ideally, I tend to advise people to keep lunch in. Um, because then it's harder, if they skip lunch, it's harder to maintain the benefit given by time restricted feeding. You're just eating less. Mm -hmm. Because you spread out better, so if you have a late breakfast in an early evening and you skip the lunch, um, some people psycho-emotionally do better because they keep themselves busy through lunch and they don't have to think about food and off they go. But personally, uh, the earlier part of the day and lunch, I prefer to have a good amount of food. Body can deal with it, still relax before food. Eat your food, relax, and maybe relax a little bit afterwards. Maybe, you know, stand up, walk around the block, do whatever. Just allow the body not to just sit there. Um, and then, you know, perhaps go for uh, 16 hours from the time you eat. So, personally now I see better results with slightly delayed breakfast, very late lunch, very early dinner, and then fasting after that. It seems to actually support better quality of sleep. Hmm. Really interesting. We have not talked about this before, but I would say that I really agree for a variety of reasons. A lot of studies show that the gut hormones, when you skip breakfast, become suppressed. So I Correct. was never really a fan of, you know, we know that, you know, insulin Correct. is regulated by GLP-1 and secretin and CCK and all these hormones. So we don't want those to be suppressed. So I've always been a fan Correct. of eating breakfast. And so I'm, I'm, I like that idea. And then uh, skipping dinner is really great. A lot of people, that's generally their worst <laughs> meal because they're, like you said, socializing, having wine. They eat late. They sit there in a full belly and go to bed. So it's really interesting. And then thirdly, the circadian rhythm research that we mentioned shows that the gut is really active, you know, again, between like 10 a.m. and yeah. about 4. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of evidence independently of your own findings working with yourself and patients and clients. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Right yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the extreme is if I, you know, if I look in my family, one of the members of my, in my family in Italy, he does intermittent fasting, he does everything right, but has this absolutely huge meal in the evening and his sleep is affected, his glucose is up and, and it, it, is, it creates, a, that's a, an N1. Can I take that into a you know, double blind placebo controlled trials? No, it's not. Yet, at clinical level and observing uh, people's metabolisms, behavior, Definitely, I found better result ongoingly on having, unless someone wants to suppress appetite. Mm. In that case, they may benefit, but they need to be adrenally quite sound. They, they, they have to, so many times I find that people skip breakfast, they still have three, four, five hundred calories coming from a fatty coffee or, or a fatty tea or something. Okay. Mm. I'm not sure. I prefer when you fast, you fast. When you eat, you eat. Mm. And when you eat, you have your fibers, you have your uh, antioxidants from vegetables, you have your protein, you have your fat. And what I've noticed is that people have proper meals. They may not have to go to these uh, strategies to try to maintain the brain quiet about the monkey brain, I call it, Labrador brain, or call it whatever you want to call it. But the one that wonders about the food and the grass is always greener somewhere mm -hmm. else, that, that kind of brain. So to me, I just slightly delayed the breakfast and uh, have an early dinner. I don't, you know, early dinner is still three, four o'clock, so you can kind of consider in lunch, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and this is still, so there is a time, there is no time in which the gut is out of complete fermentation, it's still fermenting, it's still happy, and then you fast all the way. And I have found that the appetite stay the same, so for me it's a benefit because I don't want my appetite going down, and it also is less risky, because yeah. the body knows now I'm eating, now I'm not. It's not that I'm not eating, but I'm having lots of fats. Yeah. So. It's really fascinating and you hit on something that I didn't address that people ought to know about if they haven't taken a deep dive into their circadian rhythm research. Mm -hmm. We know that the circadian rhythms 
from the brain affect peripheral organs like the GI tract, yep. but there's a bi-directional system like you mentioned. So jet yep. lag, you're coming from the UK to speak in, in the US, by you giving your gut food, that's then telling your brain that it's yep. daytime. So that's really an awesome reinforcing point. You know, So people just, you know, they do this fatty coffee, like you mentioned, they're skipping meals. Sometimes they have dinner, sometimes not. It's bouncing all, inconsistency in the body is gonna affect those rhythms, so. The, the body has, uh, my belief is that the body has to be versatile. I understand that. Yet the body loves routines. Mm. I, we, we can stay up and stay here in state, you know, I have clock gene. I would be the typical disaster for jet lag. I'm happy to sleep 20 minutes here, be away for three hours, sleep for three hours. It, I used to be an absolutely nightmare. And so some, uh, we have a, a colleague friend in common that has the same uh, same mutation um, but that does not classifies us yet I've noticed that when I have certain routine either placebo either conscious uh, effect either true double blind placebo control effect I know it works so I have very specific routines in the morning I have specific routines for foods and I have specific routines in the evening. And that, the body seems to hang on very quickly. So if I'm traveling across a couple of continents where the time zone difference is more than three, four hours, then I, as soon as I'm on the plane, I adopt whatever is the time of the zone I'm flying into with the same eating behavior. Mm. And that to me has proven to be gold dust. Mm. Because automatically, the body thinks, all right, I'm having carbs, it must be afternoon. If I'm having slightly less amount of vegetables and perhaps a slightly bigger portion of protein with some really good fat and a good coffee, then my body must think that is actually morning. Mm. So that to me is really, really important. That's huge. So you're in training your circadian rhythms using food Correct. as soon as you start traveling, not Correct. like when you get there. Because a lot of people say, oh, the night when I land in Australia, I take my melatonin or whatever. So that's really... Awesome. I hardly use any melatonin at all. And if I use it, I use it within one milligram. Low dose. It's just a little prompt. Imagine, um, imagine a, a kind of a homeopathic effect. So you just say, hey, melatonin, this is when it should be. But I don't, I, don't, I don't want to rely, because I'm one of these guys that if it takes slightly too much melatonin, I wake up between 4 and 4.30. There is a rebound effect that it's, it's quite, I think our colleague, uh, Dr. Carrie Jones, she will, she's way more qualified to explain this mechanism to me than me. But if you have a too high peak of melatonin, that actually has been found to, to, in some individuals to be counterproductive. Mm. I seem to be one of them. Hmm. And, and, and to me, either through, we need food, and through food, I think food is part of our behavior. So this system, would it work in three times a day, if you eat three times a day? No, it wouldn't, because the body would not know what, you know, when is the sleeping time, so mm -hmm. when you have quite prolonged. So it, I take intermittent uh, fasting, or what I call it, is time to the feeding as an opportunity to regulate. And the beauty is it used to work either way. So it used to work when I used to not have breakfast or not have dinner, as long as you have been on that for at least one to two months. Mm, okay. That's the important bit. So the body has to be used to that type of eating. Mm -hmm. So, because we haven't talked about this before, so you've been eating in this restricted fashion to further entrain your circadian rhythms. Correct. Oh, I didn't know that. That's awesome that we... Okay. No, that's good. No, we talk about all these weird things, but that's really yeah, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, because uh, I think uh, uh, so many... With the world nowadays so intertwined between different continents, and, yeah. you know, up a year and a half ago, I've never visited the U.S., mm. I've been five times in yeah. the last whatever time. So, and I used to dread uh, adapting, adapting yeah. because it's, it's, it, I know for me to rein in an hour in my sleeping time, it would take me weeks. Mm -hmm. With food, it was virtually immediate, from night one. 
And as you know, I've got data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite a lot of data. Speaking of which, so if, uh, if folks want to check out your work, Alessandro, you have a great website with tools and videos. Yep. Um, as we part ways, can you let listeners know a little bit more about that? Yeah, there is really simple. Uh, um, is alessandroferretti.co.uk. Is, um, everything is free. Uh, there is no membership, there is nothing. You can just go in, check the videos, check the blogs, and I generally, not so much recently, but generally I keep it up to date uh, with some new things and probably I'm going to post this blog if, yeah. with your consent. Um, so yeah, just my full name, alessandroferretti.co.uk. And um, yeah, have fun in that and I hope whatever I do is actually useful for people. Yeah, I hope they'll check out the first interview that we did because that was really fascinating too about a year ago. So appreciate you coming on the show again. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and keep up all the experimentation and sharing it with us. It's really <laughs> very welcome, powerful. Mike. Anytime, anytime. Very, very pleasure to be here.